Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. In the beginning, I was really excited to go on this journey. I haven't, you know, shot anything yet, but uh, when you see this character and when you see how Jason Momoa is going to play this guy, it's going to be amazing. Yeah! The original Aquaman needed to get a little bit of a boost. <laughs> Hello. And so they thought there was no better person to play that than me. How cool is that? I gotta be that mother. Casting Jason was a really bold move, and I got to give credit to DC and Warner Brothers and Zack Snyder for making that call five years ago. I came into Zack's office and did an audition, and he goes, I want you to play Aquaman. And I'm like, who? You want me to play what? I can just think it's white, blonde hair, shaved, <laughs> not me. And he tells me the whole pitch, and I was like, wow, hell yeah, I'd love to. It's just the idea of having a brown skin superhero. I mean, that's awesome. From the Philippines to Hawaii to Tahiti and Fiji, everyone has their water gods that they celebrate. Ours is Tana Loa and Kana Loa and Maui, and it just made sense. But you can't say anything for, you know, at least a couple years, and it sucked. I can't keep a secret to save my life. I buy a present for my wife, and I come home and I want to tell her. I can't keep a secret from my kids, so I hated doing interviews because people were like, you're gonna do Aquaman. I'm like, nope, I have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, I just had a lie nonstop. I told some dude he could punch me in the face, so I still owe him that. <laughs> but it feels great. At least people know it's gonna come out of the line anymore. At last, the reality of it has finally arrived. Jason's big moment taking up the trident. Ladies and gentlemen, your Aquaman, Jason Momoa! Everybody's talking about Jason at Comic-Con and running out and playing the trident like Jimi Hendrix. He crushed that thing, so Jason's all, you know, Jason's doing his thing. Comic-Con! That was surreal. I've been in that room many times, but I've never ran barefoot with a trident before. That's why fighters don't run out all amped up, because I could barely breathe when I got there. I was so excited. The king is here! Jason's had a long time to really think about who his character is. And, you know, all credit to Jason that uh, he was so on board with my vision. I just read James' script, and I'm really, 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 really happy and stoked. Aquaman really is a classic story about a guy who feels like he's from two different worlds, and ultimately he doesn't feel like he belongs to either one. That resonated with me instantly. You know, being born in Hawaii and raised in Iowa, being split between my parents, it's just you're not really knowing where you're. One place you're, you're a white guy over here, you're another thing, so it's just kind of like, he's the lone wolf in the whole thing, so I definitely can identify with that. Jason knows the emotion of the story, but he also worked out so much, getting all that muscle definition to get the body of a leading man. <laughs> I think James wants me really slim, and so I get like two and a half months of just doing like fight choreography and then, you know, indoor climbing. Probably just climb a lot. So, like, your body is constantly working. And then this is some meat. <sighs> So I ran out of my house and just threw some meat in my pocket. I always have meat in my pocket. It's weird. This part sucks. In pre-production, Jason spent a lot of time in harnesses on this job, you know, just rehearsing and just sort of defining his movement for his character in the rigs. <laughs> That's the fun part is I got to build this character. So I go boom and I hit it and then I can control my whole upper body. I enjoy the creative aspect of that. It starts to take its toll after 12, 13 hours a day. It's like a giant giving you a wedgie, but you're stuck in the wedgie. <laughs> Just stay in the wedgie for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Ah! And it's not a comfortable thing, those rigs. Oh, yeah, that's nice and tight. Drop me, Jack. Jack, you have the most important job of getting me the f out of this thing, OK? <laughs> When we start shooting, I'll probably be very sad because I've been away from my kids for almost two months. Yeah, I'll probably just be missing my family, man. Hey, Hi. 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 You going to bed? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Heck no, there's not. Oh, boy, baby. These guys are imposters. Ready and... Don't believe it, son. Roll. What's up, yeah. The Aquaman's gonna save you. <laughs> Filmmaking is such a challenging industry that we're in. <laughs> You can't really make a movie like this without a sense of intensity. I take my action very seriously. You all right? Yeah, yeah. I enjoy doing my own stunts. You don't like that? You don't like French vanilla ice cream? That tastes good. <laughs> he loves the sort of physicality of performing. I'm gonna shoot it. And action. I put ideas in anything that I do. I feel like that's my job. And it made sense to me that he's going to become the one who can wield the trident later. But I wanted him to be very much like a bar fighter. And then you get to take what he's going to be great at with a little bit of that bar fighting. He's going to be a fun character to watch fight. Jason, up the stab, you know, rise up so you face that camera. It's fun being a boy and playing and fighting. <laughs> but the more takes we do, the harder it gets. Action! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that was real. I'm getting older. It's hard to recover. Oh, sorry, you okay? Yeah. Jason is awesome. There's a little humor or playfulness that Jason has, and that's important. He's such a presence on screen, and you can see the fun, the charm behind the eyes. That's, to me, what always sort of sets people apart. I have to tell you, working opposite him was so fun. I mean, he's got so much energy. Jason has this gift of he's just a big kid. If you take a look at Jason on set, he's walking around, he's playing his bass guitar. I'm learning bass. I never learned bass before. That's rad. Keeps me ready. He's been in the business for so long, so he's a mentor to me. I watch how he works the set and how he's very attentive to the shots and the details. And, you know, he's on top of it. Can we go a little higher? Anywhere in here, chest, anything? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Action! I exude a lot of energy on set. Sometimes I love to kind of roll my actors up, and uh, and when it's a big scene where they, they, they're supposed to be like thousands of people around, it's cool to just get on the microphone and just yell at the actors. Get energy! Get energy! You're not welcome! The crowd is so against Jason, so uh, the idea to just boo him was fun. So Jason's making fun of James for, you know, trying to act like the crowd. Dude, James, I love the idea. I think we're going to need someone else to say it. <laughs> <laughs> just act, Jason, really. That's all you got to do. Just act. Yeah, just just act, Mike. I'm not, I'm not like you, Patrick. He's such a larger-than-life character, but when you get to know him, he's such a family man. He loves his wife, he loves his kids, and that's what he lives for. I love you. I love you. Whether people understand or not, it's, it's, it's a lot of travel and away from home. I have never went two months without seeing my kids, so if you interviewed me a month ago, I was in hell. But my family's in town, so my wife and my children are with me, which has been amazing. And... When Yaya yeah, walked out in costume, my son was there. And that was cool, because my son just ran at him. And I was like, don't, it's like a, I don't know how much that suit is, but don't beat that suit, I can't afford it. Hi, Mark. I'm trying to take experiences from everyday life and put it into the character, especially with the father role. <laughs> oh, brother. Love you, love you. It's a man. Him, so there is Idol. When we talked to Jason about who he saw as his father, he just immediately wanted Tamura. I love him. I've always it's been a dream to work with him, man. Ever since I saw What's for Warriors, he's like the guy I looked up to. So, I mean, it was epic. He saw a movie I was in, an old movie of mine called Once We Were Warriors. And it really impinged on him, this film, in, in certain ways, culturally, spiritually. I guess for him, too, being a brown boy brought up in Iowa, he kind of identified with the, the cultural elements, you know, having Hawaiian roots himself. And I notice on this journey as well, Jason's very much trying to bring to the fore some of the cultural elements. We added a bunch of Polynesian moments where, you know, we do the Hongi and put nose to nose and 
It was great. I'm really happy that James saw that. And let's cut it. Good. Great. And left it in the movie. Beautiful. I think a lot of the Polynesian, a lot of the Islanders will be very appreciative for that. So we have a good connection. Him and I love the haka. Ha being breath, ka being fire. So it's like, like a fire dance. I used to do it growing up, so uh, it comes in handy for all that energy stuff. <laughs> you can get that. Get it all warmed up and ready to rock. <laughs> And on his birthday, they put on a big uh, haka. I turned 38 while I was here, and that was amazing. Everyone surprised me. First surprise I've ever had in my life, so that was pretty special. Five minutes. Five minutes. Rob Cowan got me, and he goes, Jason, we need to talk. And he brought me outside. And then I just hear the sound of like people going off. And I can hear the haka, but it's just not computing in my mind. And then he just kind of walks away. I turn and I see it, and I'm like, oh my god. So, so, they got me so bad. And then it was just amazing to see my son in there doing the haka. Everything about him comes back to the fact that he is such a loving dad, a loving husband, and that's the most important thing to him. Greatest birthday ever. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to bring his personality out of the real world and into the world of this film. I came because I had no choice. I came to save my home and the people that I love. What's great about the superhero movies is just to show hope. I was raised by my mother. She was just on the carpet with me. My mother is a superhero. Single mothers are superheroes. I'm just a dude dressed up. Man allows me to make a war creation film. It's a fantasy world. So literally everything has to be made up. From James, it's one of the most exciting parts of the process. It's challenging because you're designing a whole different world that we've never seen before. And you're doing it from scratch. In the comic book, they incorporated Atlantis into the storyline of the DC Universe. And I really love to dive into that world and basically create my version of what Atlantis would look like. And so to do that, I have to go further back, give it backstory. And some of it I pulled from the mythology and legends that we're familiar with, but other things I get to kind of create my own. Our Atlantis is a civilization that has been around for a long time. They're way more advanced than everyone else was at that time, thousands of years ago. And so I went and talked with my production designer, Bill Bretsky, and just designed the world with him. Me and James, we wanted to make a neoclassic culture that was on the verge of, like, digital technology. 
because they weren't like a primitive culture that went underwater. They're already pretty advanced. But the thing they invented gave them power to live underwater. One of the things I really wanted to jump into early on is just getting the aesthetic correct. And we have an amazing army of concept designers and artists who are so brilliant in what they do, and just bring them on board early on and just talking to them about the look, the style, and the kind of flavor that I'm going on for the world. I'm a very hands-on designer. I love drawing myself. And so I'll kind of <laughs> get in there, you know, kind of, you know, be behind their shoulders and kind of go, oh, what about, you know, if we draw the trident more like this? Maybe uh, the skinny uh, might look better, right? Look, look more dangerous if yeah. it's more pointy. You know, that's just the process that I love, drawing and designing this incredibly vivid and lush wall. Hey, <laughs> Those early days of us sitting in a room with a bunch of artists and James and just coming up with, what about this and what if this is the way the city worked, it was really exciting. The royal guards are only in the royal palace, right? Mm -hmm. Or anywhere anything related like the Colosseum, but we don't see them outside of that. We don't ever see them in battles or anywhere else. As a director, I try to put myself in the shoe of an Atlantean and go, what is a day in the life of an Atlantean look like? How do they eat? How do they sleep? How do they use the bathroom? <laughs> and so you have to think about all that stuff, and all that stuff then affects, you know, the world that you're trying to create. Here in the surface world, you know, we built things out of materials such as brick, wood, metal. They don't necessarily have that down there. And so we're trying to pull a lot of influences from the ocean. The idea that maybe their buildings are very much like coral, that they're grown, perhaps, right? And how does that work? And is it a living thing that they live inside? Is the building just glowing with bioluminescent glow? They're so deep down that sunlight doesn't penetrate the ocean at that depth. So what provides the light source? That's the kind of stuff that we have to really dig deep into. The development on this movie was a huge effort. It was just amazing the amount of stuff that came out of James's mind. This part here, when it's like this, it blocks, it blocks the yeah, it blocks the point of impact. And he's not going to settle for anything that isn't exactly what he was hoping for. So I think what's angling more towards this camera. Good. Let's cut it. Going to this, I knew that it would be super visual effects heavy. And I don't think there is one frame in this movie that isn't touched by visual effects in some ways. Through the sort of post-production process of working on the visual effects, working on the CGI, we started to fine tune and hone the look. We started out doing renditions of what an underwater environment would look like. And we had to really leverage other aspects that will be visual cues to the audience that we are indeed underwater. Just trying to go, OK, at what point does this look like water? And one of the things we found through our discovery process is we constantly need just particles floating, floating particulates. So we always have this particulate in our water volume. And you'll notice that as the characters move through the water volumes, that particulate moves around them and it moves with them. That really helped to remind the audience that they're underwater. And of course, you know, the flowing hair really helps that. One of the most important visual cues for underwater was what we did with the hair. I mean, we knew going into this that the hair was going to be difficult, but I don't think anyone appreciated how difficult it was going to be. In an underwater environment, all the hair just sort of tends to do its own thing, and this created for incredible computational hurdles to overcome. ILM actually rewrote their software trying to design this. I mean, there's over 500 shots in the movie where we had to add hair to our characters. Um, what's the plan again? The plan is to not get killed. Very early on in the process, James and I had a long discussion about how we're going to be dealing with talking underwater. Wait, you can talk underwater? Hey, I can talk underwater too. This is awesome. And what we wound up doing was thinking about how we talk. We make sounds by exhaling air over our vocal cords. So they have adapted their vocal cords to make noise when water is passed over them. When they exhale water, they make sounds the same way we do when we talk through the air. Oh, we can do more than just talk. So everything visual 
would start from the seed of the story concept. When you know your characters really well, when you know your world really well, it makes it easier for you to kind of visually design the world. James has a very clear vision of what he wants to do, but then he'll turn to you and say, what do you think? And then he listens, and he's very much a best idea wins kind of director, but definitely the captain of the ship at the same time. Very good. Let's cut. Let's roll right into another one. Filmmaking is such a difficult task, and it's great when we work together because we all want to make a great film. And action! I'm such a big fan of the superhero universe and science fiction movies and those big, giant Japanese kaiju films. And I felt that this movie really allows me to touch on all these different worlds that I love, that I'm such a fan of. And it definitely, it was such an honor for me to get the opportunity to create this film. Black Manta, Aquaman's most iconic foe. Pirate, mercenary, supervillain. What's going on, people? My name is Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, and it's been my pleasure to bring Black Manta to life in James Wan's Aquaman. When I was casting this role, I started to research everything there was to know about this character. What is he like in the comics? And why is Black Manta so obsessed with Aquaman's destruction? Turns out, Black Manta is a lot more than just a big, scary helmet. Black Manta made his debut in 1967 in Aquaman number 35. In his early appearances, Black Manta and his minions were merely obsessed with conquering Atlantis. But in the late 70s, Manta's rivalry with Aquaman took a deadly turn. In a bid to create an underwater homeland for his people, appointing himself as their tyrannical leader, Black Manta caused the death of Arthur and Mera's only son. This blood feud has fueled their mutual hostility ever since. In the 1990s, a new origin for Manta was revealed, where he was kidnapped as a child and resented Aquaman for not coming to his rescue. Jeff Johns ultimately revitalized the character in DC's New 52 relaunch, focusing again on Arthur and Black Manta's deadly familial vendettas. In James Wan's Aquaman, we see a fresh interpretation of Black Manta that combines his various comic book incarnations with a unique new design for the DC on-screen universe. If there's one characteristic of Black Manta that has been integral to every depiction of him. It's his control of powerful technology. Even though he is a mere mortal beneath all that armor, his sophisticated weapons and vehicles effectively level the playing field. The Manta Sub. It is high speed, stealth equipped, armed for any type of battle that you can imagine. It's got cutting edge stealth armor to avoid sonar arrays, silent turbine engines, a not so silent Gatling gun. What Manta is really known for is his armored suit and his arsenal. In the film, even before he leveled up to a full-fledged supervillain, he still had a pretty impressive set of toys, like this specifically designed rebreather helmet that helps Manta and his henchmen transition between different pressurized environments with ease. A bracer. David flicks his wrist, and a long blade shoots out, which brings me to this cool prop from the film, Black Manta's grandfather's knife. It's heavy, it's a real knife, it'll cut you. And it has the silhouette of a manta ray just right here. It's obviously very inspiring for David Kane. Now, these tools and weapons may be devastating against the average submariner, but they are the weapons of mortal men, so they only work against mortal men. <laughs> With this new suit, made from the deconstructed Atlantean technology supplied by King Orm, he's able to transform himself into a formidable adversary for Aquaman. By the time Manta faces off with Aquaman for the second time, he's upgraded his artillery just a little bit. Most importantly is now his knives are made out of Atlantean steel, which is lightweight, 
aerodynamic and has the ability to penetrate Aquaman's skin. This gauntlet, it fits onto the arm and with a simple flick, it shoots out. Now he can move his arm faster and be even more deadly. Manta also sports another gauntlet that has an electrified harpoon cable. This high-velocity harpoon sends a powerful electric current into Aquaman or any other enemy silly enough to get in his way. This bad boy that we're looking at right here is Black Manta's hydroplasma rifle. It is badass. I mean, it's about 40 pounds, but once you have to pick it up 10 to 20 times for takes, it starts to feel like it's 100 pounds, right? It converts water into plasma rays, and when you pull it, it makes a lot of noise and causes a whole lot of destruction. Black Manta, being the genius that he is, converts it into technology for his own Manta suit. One of the really cool features that you'll notice if you look at the movie, there was a red light originally at the top of his gun. It becomes part of his spine on the Manta costume. And when it's all the way lit, that's an indication that you should get out of the way. Now, the first thing that comes to mind when people think of Black Manta is often his huge helmet with the big red eyes. And behind those eyes is a built-in heads-up display with vital information about his environment and his enemies. Black Manta has equipped his suit with these really cool jetpacks. This jetpack rests on Black Manta's shoulders, which gives him extraordinary maneuverability. If we look at this boot, he has a jetpack coming out the back of his calf which means that he can now jump extremely high into the air. He can swim really fast. And this, paired with this, makes him a very powerful mover above ground. Now, all of this high-tech wizardry looks really effortless in the film, but it takes a lot of off-screen work to make the on-screen Manta as awesome as he is. In real life, the suit is not powered by some futuristic saltwater engine. It works on the fantastic effort of the crew and the designers who helped to make this film look great. So thank you to you all for helping me to look as badass as I did in the movie. It's been an amazing adventure bringing Black Man to the life. And you know, we haven't seen the last of him on film. So stick around and we'll get to see who's the real king of the seven seas. Spoiler alert, it's this guy or that guy. I think it's that guy. Peace. Atlantis has always had a king. Now I need something more. But what could be greater than a king? A hero. Between the two of them, between Nicole and Amber, they bring so much emotion to these two characters, and I'm so lucky to have them in this film. He described the character, a leader, commander, tough, in charge. I think all he had to do is say, sword and crown. You get a sword, and you get a crown. And I was like, I get to fight and rule? OK. Power? <laughs> all right, cool. I'll do it. Sounds right in my alley. What I loved is how cool the costume was when they came up with all the things that I've used to battle and survive. I love the strength of her. Amber, you know, one of the things that struck me when I first met her was just how charismatic and charming she is. And Mira is such a strong character. In the comic book world, she's actually more powerful than um, Arthur is in a lot of ways. She has powers that even Arthur doesn't have. She's a strong woman. I mean, she could kill me, really. I mean, she sucked the water right out of me. She's got this amazing power. You know, I don't even know your name. It's Princess Yumira Javela Chala. You may call me Mira. What I love so much about our movie is that James, no, the writers, none of the producers, none of them want to see uh, or create another damsel in distress. And I, for one, um, am the last person to sign up for such a role. Mira is very much her own superhero. And I wanted to very much do justice to the Mira that has been created in the comic book world already. Action! But then allow for my own personality and the role that they have created for me in being a strong, proactive, powerful force on her own part to inform my modern version of Mira. 
One of the things I love the most about Aquaman is that it reacts to our audience's desire to see women occupy stronger roles. It looks good. Yeah, yeah. it's a great car. It was very important for me to tell Mira's story as well. She is really effectively the one that saves the world. <laughs> I need you to come with me to Atlantis. If it weren't for her, uh, none of it would happen. Our lead characters go on this crazy fun journey, and along the way, it's a, like a rite of passage story. They learn who they are and what they're meant to be. She's destined to fulfill that role that Queen Atlanta filled before her, a true Atlantean queen. You've been here alone for 20 years? Yes. The emotional spine of this movie really is Queen Atlanta. So much of the movie is happening because of her. It was super important for us that we cast the right actors for this role. I like this last moment to be a bit more sort of um, taking your time, you know, soaking it in. We knew we needed an iconic actress to play this role. We knew it had to be somebody who would bring so much to the table just by looking at them and really bring gravitas to the role. Nicole was my one and only choice. I've wanted to work with Nicole for a very long time. I, I think the world of her. James always said the perfect person would be Nicole Kidman. And before we cast the role, we drew her into the concept art. So all of the wardrobe art, everything that had Atlanta, always with Nicole Kidman's face. And James would say, you know, I hear that Nicole wants to work with me. And we would all kind of laugh at him and say, yeah, I'm sure she wants to work with you. I'm sure she does. But when we reached out, it turned out she actually really did. James, you know, he's an auteur. And I was just, like, really grateful that James said to me, yeah, come and play her and, and let's have some fun together. Casting Nicole as Queen Eleanor, you know, is heaven to me. Nicole just has a wonderful warmth about her. And, you know, at times I was actually a little starstruck because I'd, I'd be looking at her and I'd be looking into her wonderful blue eyes going, oh, you know, there's a real movie star for you. And uh, she made it fun. Eleanor is definitely not a pushover, you know. She's come from a long line of really powerful female warriors. She's the queen. <laughs> and fight off eight of them or 12 of them, yeah. It was easy. <laughs> Nicole just comes in and just blows us all away. She's so incredible at what she does. James told me that I would get to have Jason as the baby and then I get to be his mother when he's grown up, but that I've always seen it in him and knew he was gonna be the king. That's what a mother knows. That's a mother's instinct. The one true king. The women in this movie are super important. They bring the best out of him. Superhero movies are only as good as the supervillains that the heroes are battling against. Orm and Black Mantic delivered on all fronts. If you look at Jason strictly as a visual cutout, <laughs> you know, he looks like a biker, he looks like a tough guy that you wouldn't want to pick a fight with in a bar. You got enough footage. Knowing Jason is the big dude, you know, and I'm barely six feet, so you got to do a lot of work, otherwise you just look like a skinny guy in a muscle suit. <laughs> I wanted to gain weight, man. I wanted to get kind of big, but because of the way that the suit's going to be built, if I get too big, then I'll be bulky and things like that. But I'll probably still sneak on about a good eight pounds or something like that between now and May. They won't notice, or they will, but they'll deal with it. When we made Patrick the offer for King Orman, obviously he knew that Jason was playing Arthur Curry. He said, I am going to start working out this exact instant. We've been busting our ass so much to try to give him a formidable opponent. You can't just see Aquaman kick everybody's ass. You want, like, just a shred of, can he do this? Maybe he can't. 
the goal for this was weight gain, getting bigger, stronger. I did it before the wrong way, which was fun. Can't really do that here. I've always known Patrick to be a very physical guy, and I knew that this role would give him the opportunity to really showcase how strong he can be. When he showed up down here, he was a monster. And he really had transformed himself into a guy that when he stands next to Jason, you're not sure who's going to win that fight. I got my mind blown by Patrick Wilson on my first day. And I said, oh, oh, that's the movie that we're doing. A lot of my job is to work out and, you know, clank an iron. It's like playing a sport or something like that, and then someone gets a little bit more physical. And then you say, oh, OK. Oh, it's like that. We're playing like that. Game on. We need badass Black Manta. <laughs> and it's unfortunate that we couldn't get him. So this guy will do. I'm just I beat the shit out of him, so, you know. Make your head. Right, I'm on the <laughs> you look sad. I know, you too. You're like, oh. <laughs> as long as I can look really good for my shirt off scene and steal all of Jason's fans. <laughs> I want them to say, I want Black Manta to win. I'm the good guy. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, it's just terrific. And I think he's brought a sense of intensity to the role. Have a shirt off scene that's coming later on. We did a screen test. James said, "Hey, um, let's just let's just zip that down and let's just get some shots." So I zipped it down. I came back a couple days later, and they said, "Hey, man, I think the shirt's got to come off, man. We got to do some rewrites, you know." So, do, 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 do. I'm happy about that. Because there's numerous characters in here, we start out in the drill process to see what their strengths and weaknesses are and we build on their strengths, and that's how we choreograph their fights. If you're bigger and stronger like Jason, you're going to make him look brute power, strength, more like barroom brawler. But you still have to have a little flair to it. And then Patrick, he's the king. He has a kind of arrogance. I am the one true king. And we also wanted Orm to be a little more flashy, so it's a little more fluid than maybe a little less brute than Arthur has at some points. And then, of course, there's Black Manta, who's a pirate. And you just want to make him more like the street. You know, he's not a superhero. He's just a scrapper. He's a scrappy fighter. So that's how we designed his fights. We fight with our hands, and we fight with whatever we can find and pick up. I got my gauntlet that comes out. <laughs> Damn, you don't know your own strength, my friend. He comes in, jetpacks. He's flying. I have laser eyes. I'm so prepared now, so prepared. Patrick got big, but Yaya got ripped. I'm not sure who, who put on more weight, but Yaya definitely, he won. What's up, Patrick? What's up now? Mm. Um, and I always joke, like, man, I did like five months of working out. And what was on screen, which literally comes down to about one arm, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> man, those guys just ate whatever they wanted to and lift weights like bastards. I like to work on Jason more than I work on Aquaman. So we have those little inside jokes when we get on set, get across from each other. And I whisper, oh, somebody just turned 38 and that's almost 40. That's almost pretty cool, man, you know? 38, 40, just round up, just get there already, you know? Leave, leave the 30s to me. I got my butt kicked a lot of days for that. I mean, these stunt guys are just unbelievable. They really are. The whole team, from top to bottom, you know, really make us look great. We teach them the moves, but they're the ones that bring it to life. The best thing about playing a villain is that you have the best lines, I think I'm gonna need a bigger helmet. And you win all the fights except for the last one. And if it wasn't for that darn Mera, I would have had him. It would have been a much shorter movie. Hi, I'm Amber Heard. <laughs> I'm Jason Momoa. 
Mm. One bass. Mm. Blah, 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 blah. Mm. Me, Jason Moore. <laughs>
these guns through some process of fusion take water and turn it into this source of tremendous energy. It's a very powerful super soaker. <laughs> You know, when it fire, its muzzle flash it has a sort of hydro water quality to it. When Work does his power up on his gauntlet, it's pulling in water from the environment. And then when he punches, it releases this <laughs> another form of, of hydropulse energy. The Atlantean suit, in a lot of ways, works like a reverse astronaut suit. The suit keeps the water inside, keeps the air out. Whenever they left the water, there's a visor that would move up into place. When you're underwater in their natural environment, their visors just sort of dissolve away because they're not necessary. What the? A big part of these scenes, the idea that I can design my own, basically, spaceships underwater while giving each kingdom a very different specific aesthetic. The Zebelian ships have bioluminescent technology. Fishermen people, they have these ships that look very much like ocean life form, you know, like giant sea turtles. Some of them are actually individual side ships for one person. The brine kingdom. They're actually the real cool part of the battle. So they have like these crab guns and they, they grab up lava. The Atlanteans have very, very high-tech, giant, giant ships. Some of the Atlantean ships look like stingrays. I really hope I get an opportunity to do another project in a world where no one's ever seen, because we got to challenge physics making this end battle sequence. It was so much fun. And it looks amazing. One of the most fun things for me about making this movie is designing the different creatures that populate this crazy underwater world. There's a wide range of creatures inhabiting the underwater world. Some of the creatures are familiar and some are very new. It's an unexplored world. The world of Atlantis has all sorts of unknown life that we've never seen before, and it comes springing from the imagination of James Wan and all the great artists that worked on the project. Aquaman riding a seahorse is one of the most absurd images from the comics. And one of the challenges going into this was how do you get past the sort of joke of Aquaman riding the seahorse? What James wanted to do was embrace it. Let's not pretend that these aren't the iconic images of Aquaman. Let's make them cool and make them awesome. Going into it, I wanted different animals to differentiate the two separate kingdoms. With the Zebelians, they have taken to seahorses. And the king rides in on a beautiful, majestic sea dragon. They do feel like ancient knights, but with a sort of fantasy science fiction twist to it. Meanwhile, the Atlanteans have domesticated and tamed all the really dangerous sharks. Willem gets to ride this giant black hammerhead shark with some really spectacular armor on it. It was very important that the animals would in some way have personalities that tied in with the characters that would write them. And that's definitely the reason why King Arm's animal is an ancient tylosaur. Orm, I think he gets the coolest one. He's riding this armored Tylosaur that just looks so badass. Ah! King 
kingdoms of the underwater world. And one of the kingdoms is known as the Fisherman Kingdom. These are more like mer people. They're peaceful, docile people. The fishermen people are more intellectuals, scholars, and artists. They are ones that want to make peace with the surface dwellers. That initial design work had started, I think, early on with James and a couple illustrators. But way down the line, you know, even into filming, we were still redesigning those characters. They need to be more grounded and give them a bit more humanity. So we went in and redesigned them and kind of created class systems as well. Like you see, the soldiers are very fish-like, where you look at the royal kingdom and they're very evolved and more human. The fishermen people are basically a combination of practical makeup effects and a lot of visual effects augmentation. We did full body suits from the waist up with silicone hand appliances and full silicone face pieces, cowls, contact lenses, and teeth. The only part that we may have in visual effects is a little bit of gill movement, but overall it's a full prosthetic makeup. Prepare your arm. The Kingdom are literally the bottom feeders of Atlantis. They are the most maligned and looked down upon of the other societies. They were humans. They turned into crabs. So they're kind of like what we want for dinner. And they got multiple legs, and they're kind of brutish, and they live low on the ground in caves. The brine people, they don't swim, they walk. And these creatures are big, heavier people with massive armor. And so we started with that idea, designing what the king would look like. There's quite a bit of inspiration that came from really early deep sea diver suits. But he's not wearing a suit. That's his natural form. Death to the Atlantean hagfish! The ocean is a magical place, but it's also terrifying as well. And so I wanted this movie to be able to reflect our feelings of the great and powerful ocean. <laughs> I love the ocean. It's something that absolutely scares me and draws me in. And it's super spooky. If you've been in the middle of the ocean and you just look down, it's pretty terrifying because it's all the unknown, right? You never know what's down there. With the Trench Kingdom, I had a great starting off point because they're featured very prominently in Jeff Johns' um, New 52. And so I used that to dive into the War of the Trench Kingdom. These scary, trench-dwelling, cannibalistic creatures. But through that idea, I started to develop something that's a bit different. In the comic book, they have big, giant eyes. But I start to realize that these characters probably would not have eyes, because when you're so far down, you know, the sun doesn't penetrate that far, and there's no light. If anything, they're afraid of bright lights. And so then that started informing what the creatures would really look like. The trench creatures really allow me to lean into the horror aspect of the ocean. The trench are a super dangerous group, and James has an incredible sequence. It harkens back to his pure horror days. It's like Creature from the Black Lagoon, but the 2018 version. Down here we have a legend about the Karathan. An ancient sea monster so powerful that even King Atlan himself feared it. And now the beast has awakened. This creature is nearly as old as time itself. First and foremost, it's ginormous. In real world scale, from tip of the nose to the end of its longest tentacle, it's two miles long. We need it to design a creature that is big enough to take on Aurum's entire army. There's some aspects to it that are crab or lobster-like. It also is part giant squid. It pulled from design aesthetic from the ocean, infusing it with my love for HP Lovecraft to create the most powerful creature on Earth.
This is a movie that relies very heavily on technology to make the underwater Atlantean world come into life. I think this film is surfacing, if I may use that word, at the right time, because I think the technology has caught up with the storytelling. I don't think five years ago you could have made this movie, especially not 10 years ago. So much of our filmmaking process relies on the latest technologies in virtual production. Deserters in the trench had not yet fallen. Lost Nation had not yet vanished. Virtual production is the marrying of visual effects elements while you're on set filming the movie. Basically, when the camera is pointed at the blue screen on a particular monitor, we can actually see a version of the background that will ultimately exist when people see the film. It's interesting. They show you this previs, the previsualization of what the scene is, which looks like a video game. We had to understand how the characters were going to sit on those steeds. We take those previs assets and convert them into a mode where we can use them here on set. We had to design what we call bucks, which were essentially the proxies that characters would sit on that were then puppeteered while we were shooting. We have arranged around the stage a bunch of motion capture cameras. And they can figure out what exactly that buck is doing. Then we're able to replace that buck with a CG version of our shark and have it marry up to what the camera is doing all in real time. So they'd say, come here, this is what it's going to look like. And they'd punch that in, and they would lay over this world so we would have some imagination about what we were going to see. Surface dwellers, who arms? It takes this burden off of the director of having to think, am I framed up correctly? Am I framing for the environment? I mean, is the creature fitting in there? Kill them all! It's slow work, it's complicated work, and then, of course, it's always sweetened by special effects. We built lots of sets for this movie with virtual reality technology. VR is making a big impact on this film. How we can look around sets in a virtual space to be able to make design decisions. I've primarily been working on the Manta Sub, and VR lets you show people in a really exciting new way, because you can actually get in there and test it yourself. I have seen the virtual reality of my submarine. It's really cool. Oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. Oh, this is oh. It's pretty phenomenal how, through a combination of high-tech visual effects, as well as more traditional techniques, we were able to make this movie. We did a thing which was like a wall of water, where they came out of the wall of water into a void of no water. There was a lot of testing. Getting it right is pretty tricky, because it only stays in a sheet for so long before terminal velocity breaks it up, and we couldn't do a lot about that. But I think it worked really well. Light was really important part of creating this reality. The challenge is creating this underwater world in a dry environment. There's a whole way that light travels through water. Anytime you have light crossing through this air-water boundary, you're going to get these sort of natural refractions. It's what you see at the bottom of a swimming pool that says water. It really sort of tells you where you are. So we try to emulate that. We actually have built water trays above us to kind of manipulate the light, and it makes you feel like you're underwater. What we did in some scenes is we created these walls of light. It added another layer to the reality of it. Every single shot has its own purpose-built gimbal rig that allows us to be able to pull off what we need to do. You said we couldn't go over these walls. I did. You said they're hydro cannons. When Arthur and Mira are zipping around, we came up with the idea that they would need some kind of windshield to help them be aerodynamic. But the windshield is made from technology that can harden water to give it that glass-like quality to it. But inside the ship, there's also water. There's a moment in the movie where the car gets hit by a tsunami and washes into the ocean and washes around and lands up back on a road. We had to make the car in the tsunami. It was an eccentric spinning car that's actually getting submerged at the same time. It spins 360. And it's quite obscure because James didn't want it like a pig on a spit. Two, one, roll! I 
think ultimately because James and everyone involved did such an amazing job of embracing the aquatic technology, everything is just really well executed. We spent months developing all these techniques. And the finished product is this magical undersea world that you know nobody's really ever seen before. I didn't settle for second best. I knew this has to be amazing. You know, it's the right filmmaker, the right time, with the right technology, being able to accomplish this movie. Mission to come aboard. The film opens with a really cool submarine sequence. This is Aquaman's hero's intro to this movie. I wanted him to be very much like a bar fighter, smashing heads, kicking knees out, and grabbing things. It's just gonna be a fun character to watch fight. Jesus. He's strong. Even with that, he's super powers, he's strong. And I barely used any force on that one. <laughs> The submarine set piece was literally the first day of photography. <laughs> you know, there's no better place to start than at the deep end. First scene, I got my helmet on, my tubes. Helmet comes off. You know what I mean? It's the most badass thing I've done on film, like, thus far. The location has been in somewhat of a challenge because of how confined the space is. Tiny quarters, big wire gags. Everything was steel, metal, aluminium, hard edges. It was a good way to start the film for us. We pad the sets. Like, this is kind of crazy rubber. This is all rubber. It's because a guy hits his head on it, you know? We throw people against the walls, and these are rubber stairs. We've gotten very good at molding rubber things. <laughs> Chase is great. He's really good with us and uh, looks after us at the same time because he's a big boy, so he makes sure he gives us the right amount of strength but doesn't hurt us. <laughs> Jason's a pro. He's like an expert at hand-to-hand -hand combat and things like that, so I just follow Jason's lead on that stuff. Ah! My father gets pinned against the wall, and Aquaman's freaking leaving like a jerk. So Aquaman, in a sense, chooses to let his father die. By allowing David's father to die, in many ways sows the seeds for Mantis' revenge. You can't lead him like that! You killed innocent people. You're asked to see for mercy. It's a great introduction to Aquaman. It's a great introduction to Jason. I think it really gives you an insight into who that character is. The idea of Aquaman coming onto a submarine and saving the day is a really cool way to introduce this character. Merc crashes down here, right? He gets up, right? He runs that way. We follow behind him. Bam! Through the wall. Bam! Through the wall again. The camera spins around him to his back. Right? Mugden runs down here. Maybe he jumps down. And then uh, somewhere along in the hallway here, the camera goes out the window. And then we see her run, run, run. And then the camera then does a zoom back to find Arthur in the foreground here by the bell tower. James has ideas that scare you at first sometimes when he gives them to you. You're like, oh, I don't know how we're going to achieve this. He lands, crashes, you know, a few cuts there. He looks up, we we'll cut to his POVC mirror running. Then he goes running, then our one shot thing starts. We were talking about his conception for months. We had people running and jumping down a set of stairs, landing on the ground and keep going. And James wanted to do it as one continuous shot. The Merc Run sequence was a really fun one to design. We would kind of have like miniature rooftops kind of laid out, you know, cardboard boxes, and then toy figures that we would jump from places to places. And I would talk about, you know, where I would want to put the camera. Right, I like the idea of being on a cable cam, that go with him, we go down and without cutting, right? I want it to be an experiential moment for the audience as well. And so they're not just watching it from outside looking in, I want them to be inside as well. 
whenever we do a one shot, it's not to show how clever we are, but to say, come with us and be with us on the journey. John McAfee is this amazing second unit director, and I work closely with him, trying to work out, you know, what's the best way to shoot that. Preparation is everything for this. Come the dry run before you hook up. Go. We have tested in our early stages our camera technology, our visceral feeling of how we want to capture it. A million things do have to go right. Good, raw video, on the screen frame. James captures one shots that, you know, no one would dare take on. Yeah, man, the one. But, you know, he'll challenge you to do that. And we did it with quite a few sequences. That one in particular was amazing. And it's a one shot from start to finish. Three, two, one, go. With the camera guy following in tow. They're both on lines, they're running through walls, they're getting connected from one system to another as they turn. Uh, no! Chat! Good! Resets! Three, two, one, go! Going down balconies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I have three different set pieces happening at the same time, I look to sort of find a way visually to kind of bring and tie them all together in post-production. And we start out with that long Merc run, and then at some point we leave him, and then we go see who it is that he's chasing, and that is Mera in this case, running across the rooftop. We transition into a shot where we track upward and find Mera running on the rooftops. We blend that with her running, being chased, jumping over things. And the camera keeps pulling back. Then we go to Arthur and Black Manta at the end. It's all over the place. And so that just adds to the visual interest of the sequence. It's hard to reinvent the wheel, but I think what James really does well too is give you a different way to view the wheel. sequence when we're on the sailing vessel and we're being thrashed about in the middle of a tempest and the conditions were very real we're working under a torrential downpour which is exacerbated by the fact that just to get rain to read on camera it can't just be a normal rain it has to be the equivalent of a fire hose <laughs> pointed straight at you it's a great sequence with Arthur and Mera on the boat getting attacked by the trench creatures, and it is pure horror. And James loves that stuff. Pulling off the kind of horror and suspense and all the traits that you need to make a great horror film, he's got that, which is awesome. I definitely love the trench creatures because it does allow me to hug back to my horror roots. And so I went all out and basically made those sequences just monster movies, like just sea creature monster movies. Yeah, I think they should have their own movie. <laughs> <laughs> we had limited vision with the costumes. We had guys on stilts, a six-way motion base on a ship, tons of water. It basically was the perfect storm of what you don't want to have to deal with. It was tough in that water, in that rain, in the wind. They're jumping on and off boats, fighting with Jason, fighting with Amber. When you're in the rain and the boat's moving and the lights go off, that's fun. You're in it and you're being real. But from the depths, the scan of the light. It was a lot of fun. That was like real movie making. Throughout that whole sequence, it was James' idea to use the lightning to like strike the water and light the water up from underneath. And so you get this beautiful subsurface lighting quality where you get this sort of emerald green coming through. And it just takes what can be like a very sort of abstract, featureless, stormy environment and gives you these moments where you get like super clarity. You know, that there's like a huge wave out there and it's backlit and you can sort of see through it and it makes it beautiful. The trench sequence was one that I really wanted to create a visual look that looks like a split screen of the ocean. 
you see them with their red torch swimming down and just tens of thousands of trench coming in and following them down to the bottom. It's just an awesome shot. That part was really fun for me, trying to come up with a cool approach to digital filmmaking and to kind of challenge myself to do stuff that I haven't quite seen before. When the trench was swarming underwater, James is like, oh, wouldn't it be great if they're just like doing this sort of corkscrewing, double helix sort of pattern? It's really cool, really well done. We treated these creatures like pack animals, where they work in a cohesive sort of team kind of way. And it just took it from something that just sort of felt like, you know, flocking or swarming and just give it a lot more visual interest. So it was a fun one to uh, dive into. James Wan's kingdoms are so compelling because they have history. They're established nations with deeply felt roots and traditions. In the time before the Great Fall, Ancient Atlantis was a culture on the verge of a digital revolution, but their civilization was inevitably doomed to crumble under its own might. After the Great Fall, the kingdoms broke into separate realms, each with a unique history, society, and aesthetic. Imagine diving thousands of feet below the surface gliding past undiscovered ancient ruins, then cresting a ridge to behold the shining city of Atlantis. Its 400-foot walls and looming plasma cannons guarding a gateway to a mysterious new world. Modern Atlantis became a thriving industrialized metropolis with hordes of vehicles speeding along aquatic highways. Like their ancestors, they're dedicated to technological advancement and the consolidation of power. And they have a ring of fire. None of the other kingdoms have a ring of fire. I never thought I'd see the day when my own father would bow before the king of Atlantis. We never get a look at the kingdom of Zebel in the film, but as its king, I have the inside scoop. Zebel has a long history in the comic books. It began as an otherworldly dimension when Mera ruled as queen. But as the comics were updated, Zebel became a prison colony under Atlantis control. In the film, Zebel is the sister kingdom to Atlantis and his chief rival. To be honest, we might be able to take him in a fair fight, but we've always preferred politics to all-out war. Violence has always plagued the surface. They will destroy themselves. Zebel may be less warlike than Atlantis, but they're even more enamored with their royalty. So, of course, my people love their king, but I think they may love Princess Mera even more. The Fisherman Kingdom is a peaceful, intuitive culture whose fish-like physical evolution is the source of mankind's mythical stories of sirens and mermaids. Their architecture has a gothic feel, which is fitting for their more philosophical, poetic way of life. The fishermen are less interested in the domination of the ocean than coexisting with it. That is, until King Orm and I persuade them otherwise. <laughs> Choosing to harness the power of undersea lava flow, the brine have taken on the attributes of massive armored crustaceans. The tribe has been toughened by constant heat and pressure due to their proximity to the Earth's core and the extreme depth of their kingdom. In many ways, the brine are the opposite of the fishermen. This warrior race has the strongest military of all the kingdoms, and they value a show of force over negotiation, which is why Orm gathered the might of all the other kingdoms before attacking them. Yeah! To the Atlantean hagfish! The deserters were the weapon builders of Atlantis. Since they had already separated from Atlantis before the Great Fall, they survived that initial cataclysm only to succumb to its after effects. Cut off from the majority of their civilization and coping with a rapidly changing climate, the deserter kingdom sank under a different kind of deluge an ocean of sand. Their colossal machinery and statues of great warriors are all that remain of their once great culture. This is a hall of armory. 
where the legends say Atlan's trident was forged. The Trench Kingdom, if one can call it a kingdom, is a nightmarish world shrouded in darkness. This devolved, beast-like race was created by Jeff Johns for his new 52 reboot of Aquaman. And James Wan jumped at the chance of creating an even more horrific version of them. The Trench fell further than any other faction, shunning the advancement of their species and instead regressing to an animalistic form. They make their home in the Mariana Trench, the deepest natural point in the ocean, clinging to the craggy walls and scavenging for flesh. But they'll pop up to the surface if they can sense a tasty morsel or two. The headless statue among the Council of Kings is the only clue we have about the mysterious lost nation. Who were they? Where are they now? Perhaps we'll meet them in the future. With Aquaman, James Wan has given us a visionary take on an ancient world. We've seen the kingdoms of the Seven Seas rise, fall, and rise again. It still, it feels like its story, and Aquaman's has only just begun.